1 Samuel chapter 18 in the Old Testament. In your quiet time, I want to encourage you to read the entire chapter because it constitutes the context for the content that God will communicate to us tonight. But for the sake of time, allow me to just engage in what I would call spot reading and just read three verses. I want to call your attention to verse number five. If someone close to you does not have a Bible, I ask you to be both kind and Christian enough to share yours with them. First Samuel chapter 18, verse five, the New International Version translates the original Hebrew text in this way. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. Allow your eyes to fall down now to verse number 14, where it reads, In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. And then allow your eyes to go to verse 30, the last verse in the chapter. The Philistine commanders continued to go out to battle, and as often as they did, David met with more success than the rest of Saul's officers, and his name became well known. Heaven and earth may pass away, but God's word shall stand forever. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord our God. If you didn't pick up on it, there's a word that's used in each of the verses that were just read. It's the word success. And if you would pray with me, sincerely pray with me and for me tonight, as I've asked the Holy Ghost to anoint me afresh, I want to talk to you tonight from this thought, the other side of success. The other side of success. The other side side of success. I ask you to keep your Bibles open. Do your best not to go to sleep. I don't want you to accuse me of making anything up. The other side of success. What comes to your mind when you hear the word success? What images come to your mind? when you think about success. If we're honest, for most of us, we immediately begin to think about money, cash, cars, carrots, creature comforts. We immediately start thinking about having a bigger house and driving a certain kind of car and wearing certain kind of jewelry and having certain kinds of bags and wearing certain kinds of shoes. When we think about success, we immediately think about having fame and prestige and everybody knowing our name. When we think about success, we think about followers on our social media pages and likes on our social media pages because popularity is these days very often equated with success. For some people, it's that promotion on that job that you've been waiting for. For some, it is starting your own corporation and it becoming a Fortune 500 company. For others, it is winning an Academy or a Grammy or an Emmy Award. For others, it is selling millions of albums. For some, it is being able to have a concert like Beyonce where people are willing to pay almost $1,000 for nosebleed seats just to come and see you perform form and talk about some lemonade. It, it, it success has a way of causing these images to come to mind. And my difficulty and my tension tonight is that that is only one side of success. Yeah, to be able to marry the most perfect person in the world and to be able to have a family and to be able to last until death do you part, to be able to have a church that grows and has thousands of members and multiple services. All of those things look good, sound good, and may be good, but there is another side to success. And you've got to check yourself tonight so that you don't wreck yourself tonight because if you're not careful, you can hear the word success and only think about the sweet 
But if you only think about the sweet, you're going to miss the sour. Because success is a two-sided coin. It's a head side and a tail side. One side is sweet, but the other side is sour. One side of it is nice, but the other side is nasty. One side of it is glorious, but the other side is gloomy. One side of it is that which is disastrous, and the other one is delightful. There is another side to success. And in this, claim it and name it, blab it and grab it, call it and haul it, decree and declare it age in which we live. There are people who are perpetrators of falsities from the pulpit that would have you to think that the only way you can measure success from God in your life is for everything to always go the way you always want it to go. But there is another side to success. If you keep on living, you're going to discover that success has more than one side. And the same success that lifts you can be the very same thing that kills you. Yeah, because there's more than one side to success. Let me see if I can push this just a little bit faster down the track. Here is the most successful person arguably in the Old Testament, perhaps even in scripture, who's the pivotal personality of the story before us tonight. He's King David. King David was inarguably a success. He had already defeated a lion and a bear that tried to take his father's sheep. David was a success. David was one who had leadership ability, who was a successful shepherd, who didn't lose any sheep. He's the baby son of Jesse, and he would ultimately become the one who would be anointed by God. He would be the one that would slay the giant Goliath. He would be the one that would become best friends with the king and his future enemy's son. He was undeniably a success, but... When you look more closely into David's life, David's life shows us the other side of success. Not just the pretty side, but the ugly side of success. Is your Bible open? Please keep it open and do your best not to go to sleep. I don't want you to accuse me of making anything up. When you open your Bible to chapter 18 of 1 Samuel, you'll discover that this is the immediate aftermath of David successfully killing Goliath, who was the champion giant of the Philistines. He was reportedly Goliath, that is, some nine feet tall, he would make Shaquille O'Neal look short. And he was there, leading soldier, and David goes to him and says, you come to me with sword and shield and spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, and with one smooth stone, David lets it go in the name of the Lord, and he's able to slay the giant Goliath. Let me just say on my way to where I'm going, that giant still fall. But you'll never be able to knock them down on your own. You're going to need the power of Almighty God. And so this is the immediate aftermath of David slaying Goliath. And there's a victory parade that was consistent with their military customs. They're on their way back to town, the military, the, the army is. And as they're on their way to town, the ladies from the town have now flanked each side of the road in order to create a means by which all of the soldiers may come through and that they may celebrate them. There is Saul who did not do anything because he was a coward, even though he was a tall and big man. He didn't do anything, but he's taking all the credit as the king and then he hears the women sing this song Saul has slain his thousands but David his tens of thousands he probably couldn't hear it clearly when he first started marching back to town and the women were singing it but the closer he got the more clear it became Saul has slain his thousands but David his tens of thousands and when he heard this the Bible says uh, that he became jealous in his heart 
that this success that was celebrated in David's life that he benefited from offended him and his insecurities immediately came up and started wreaking havoc in his life and in David's. It's right there, church. It's right there that we begin to see what the other side of success looks like. Can I give it to you right quick? Success has another side and there are four things that you'll discover on the other side of success. Are you ready? Number one, you'll discover that success telegraphs truths about others. Success telegraphs truths about others. Success telegraphs truths about others. There are times in your life where you won't know how other people really feel until God blesses you in a magnanimous way. When you finally get the promotion, when you finally get the job, when you finally get the starting position, when you finally get the raise, when you finally balling and shot calling, when you're finally able to do things that emblematic uh, that which is success and are emblematic, then other folks around you show you who they really are. And Maya Angelou said, if somebody shows you who they really are, believe them. Yeah. Here is Saul, the king whom David has served. But as soon as he hears that David is getting more credit and glory than he is, the Bible says that this refrain galled him, made him upset to the point at which he became angry. Verse number eight in your Bible. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. Yeah. Success telegraphs truths about others. In other words, they won't tell you straight up that they got a little hater aid. They won't tell you straight up that they are jealous of you and upset about the success that God has given you because you were willing to trust God and obey God. Huh? So what you do is you pay attention to people around you when God starts blessing you. Because what they will do is they will do what some boxers do. They will telegraph how they really feel. Anybody that knows anything about boxing, you understand that whenever a boxer telegraphs a punch, that means that they don't throw it straight. It means that they are coming around with it so much so that you can actually see it and move out of the way before it actually hits you because they didn't come straight at you. They're going to telegraph the punch at you. Come here for a minute. There are people in your life that will start telegraphing how they truly feel about God blessing you. And everybody in your house, everybody in your church, everybody on your job, everybody in your family is not going to be excited about the success that God grants to your life. And you may miss it if you're not paying attention, but you'll see if you're looking that very often they'll telegraph the truth about how they really feel. They'll say, I'm happy for you. They'll pat you on the back and they'll say, oh, that's wonderful. But you got to pay attention to the way they communicate. Nonverbal communication accounts for some 70% of all communication. You got to pay attention to the body language. You got to listen to the tonality of their voice. You got to pay attention to their eyes. You got to listen to whether or not they're sucking their teeth. You got to pay attention to how they are fidgeting when you are around. Yeah, very often it's that nonverbal communication that telegraphs how they really, really feel about you. People may never say it, but your success will show that you have now spoiled their apple cart. And what they'll do, 
This is the way you'll know it. They'll start talking to you and treating you in a way that is insincere. Because they're insecure. They're insecure. I've learned something, Pastor Ford. You can't do anything to make an insecure individual more secure. I'll try it again. You can't do anything to make an insecure individual more secure. Because insecurity is a personal internal issue. Is anybody listening? Yeah. Yeah. That's why when you're dating somebody and they show insecurities, you better pay attention to that. Because I don't care how much you love them. I don't care how much you share your phone with them. You give them your passcodes and your passwords and your login and all that stuff. It's still not going to make them feel secure. Saul was insecure. He's the king. Position doesn't mean security. Position does not equal security. Just because somebody has the top position doesn't mean they're secure in it. Your success can become a threat to them because of their insecurities. Are you listening? And what happens after this is that Saul keeps an eye on David. And then not only does he do that, but he then shows something else. Verse 10, the next day an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul and he was prophesying in the house while David was playing his lyre as he usually did and Saul had a spear in his hand and hurled it saying to himself I'll pin David to the wall but David eluded him twice some people are not only insecure but they are insoluble that's a fancy word that simply means that they cannot be consoled no matter what you do. <laughs> David was so anointed that when he played music, it would calm Saul down. But there were occasions when Saul couldn't be calmed because there was such a storm raging on the inside. When a person is filled with inner turmoil, you're not going to be able to resolve that for them because they're insoluble. Have you ever been dealing with somebody and you couldn't do anything right? They had a complaint about everything? Oh, I guess life is better in Arizona than it is in California. Yeah. Just insoluble. You can't console them in any shape, form, or fashion. Not with gifts, not with love, not with words, nothing. Because they got internal issues that started before you and have very little to do with you. I'm going to help somebody. <laughs> I'm going to help somebody in just a minute. Yeah, they have issues that predate you that have nothing to do with you even though they express them toward you. All of that is a telegraph of how they truly feel on the inside about your success and about God's blessings upon your life. They are insecure, they're insoluble, they're intimidated, and they think that you're going to get more than them. And the truth is, they don't want you to have more than them because that's the other side of success. Here's the second thing. I'll pick up the pace. We learn from the life of David right here in 1 Samuel chapter 18, not only that success telegraphs truths about others, but look in your Bible again. Success torments others around you. Verse 11 and 12, one more time. Success torments others around you. What does it do? It torments. That means that when God's favor is on your life and God is blessing you to be successful, that the very sight of you can cause other folks to get sick. That just the thought of you can cause them inner turmoil and inner torment. Well, you'll have somebody in stitches on the inside with their blood pressure going through the roof with them fuming with anger on the inside and you've done nothing to them. You've only done things for them. Yeah. 
Sometimes your success will torment other people around you because they have not resolved their personal jealousies. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes spouses can get jealous of each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God knows church members get jealous of each other. Friends get jealous of each other. Co-workers get jealous of each other. And what happens is, is that if there's any evil in you, jealousy makes it worse. I don't have time to fully unpack it, but I think I at least ought to give it an honorable mention. Remember in verse 11 and verse number 12, the Bible talks about how when the evil spirit came upon Saul, and it was an evil spirit from God. This is what that means theologically. What it means is not that God put evil inside of Saul, but what it means is there was a time in Saul's life where Saul was anointed to lead the people of God. But because of his disobedience, God removed his anointing from Saul's life and then chose David because David was a man after God's heart. And whenever there is a vacancy on the inside of you, evil is always in the neighborhood and will see your vacancy sign and set up a residence inside of you unless God is reigning within you so Saul's having these fits because he has evil on the inside of him that is now being exacerbated now being made worse because of his jealousy towards David and then what happens sometimes is that even when you've done a lot for somebody jealousy can escape in a moment of rage where they try to take you out, where they come for you and you didn't sin for them. Where you're in an argument with them, I'm sorry, a heated conversation with them, and they out of nowhere come up with something that has nothing to do with the real issue that you all were dealing with. Because they got stuff going on on the inside that's now starting to escape. That's now starting to ooze out of them. And when they don't try to take your physical life, then they'll try to take your job. And then they'll try to mess up your name. And then they'll try to wreck your life in such a way that nobody else will want you. But oh, when the hand of the Lord is upon your life, then the Lord will deal with those that are trying to deal with you. I'll come back to that in about 12 minutes. Just understand, everybody at your school, everybody on your job, everybody in your house, everybody in your church does not celebrate God's favor on your life and the success of your life. And some of them are literally tormented by their jealousy of you. Just to look at you, even preachers get jealous of each other. I won't hang out there long. But it's the truth anyhow. Musicians and singers get jealous of each other. Why she got to sing all the time? Why he got to be the lead? Why, why he got to be the music director? Why, why she got to be this? And why does he have to be that? Just jealousy because of internal unresolved torment. Are you listening? And let me just warn you tonight on my way to where I'm going that the Lord with you does not exempt you from opposition amidst your success. As a matter of fact, the more favor you have, <laughs> the more fights you might have. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that? Yeah. The more favor you have, the more fights you may have, the more people may dislike you and be jealous of you because God is choosing to do something in your life that they don't see God doing in theirs. Here's the third thing. I'm almost done. What does the other side of success look like? It shows us, number one, that success telegraphs truths about others. Number two, that success torments others around you. But number three, success makes you a target. Success makes you a target. Success makes you a target. I don't have time to go line by line, but in between verse number 13 and verse number 27, we see how success put a target 
on David's back. So that Saul, who was unsuccessful in throwing a spear at David to kill David, then sought to set David up and sabotage him so that somebody else would get David for him. See, when people are filled with this kind of jealousy and envy, they will stop at nothing to take you down and to take you out. When God is blessing your life and people are filled with this type of internal jealousy and envy, sometimes they will stop at nothing to take you down and or to take you out, even if it means using somebody close to them just to get to you. Here it is. You can read it meticulously when you get home. You can just trust me right here because there's so many verses. This is what happens. Saul says, all right, I wasn't able to kill David myself, so this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to set David up. He says, I'm going to give him one of my daughters in marriage. And so he offers David one of his daughters in marriage. And David says, King, uh, respectfully, I've got to decline um, I appreciate the offer to become a part of your family. Now, listen, church, this marriage could have, from a political perspective, set David up to become the next king if Saul's son passed away, right? But David says, no, 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 I can't, I can't marry Marab because uh, I, I just can't do that, sir. I just want to serve you. I, I really think, I really think, Pastor Foster, I really think, that uh, the truth of the matter was that Marab just wasn't fine. That's what I really believe the truth was. I really, I really believe <laughs> that she just wasn't fine. And when you read this passage, for those of y'all that want to talk about me underneath your breath right now and in your head, if you keep reading the passage, I've got some basis for what I'm saying because when David wouldn't bite on that offer of the first daughter, then Saul offered him his other daughter, Michal, who had been looking at David and David had been looking at her and when the king offered her, he said, oh yeah, king, I, I'll be happy to take your fine daughter to be my wife. She, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm getting along in, in years now, and so back in the day, there was a song that says, she's a brick house. She's mighty, mighty, just letting it, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. She had to be fine. She was looking at him, he was looking at her, but it was a setup. Because this is what Saul does. Saul drafts his daughters, offers them as bait for David. When he bites on McCall, David hears Saul say, if you want to have my daughter as your wife, you got to bring me 104 skins from the Philistines army, our enemy as a dowry for you to marry my daughter. I don't want to get grotesque tonight, but four skins are that skin part on a man's genitalia when he's circumcised. Now don't get caught up in the genitalia. I want you to understand what's happening. Because I know some of y'all's minds get stuck real easy. Come on, stay with me. Stay with me. This is spiritual. Stay with me. It's a setup because Saul knows that it is humanly impossible for a man to go in an enemy's camp and secure 104 skins from grown fighting men and live. In other words, it was a setup because a target was on David's back. 
so that Saul could get David killed by Saul's enemies because he was so jealous and envious of David. There are some people that will use their daughter. There were some people that will use their son. There are some people that will use their sibling. There are some people that will use their parents. There are some people that will use their best friend just to set you up so that they can take you down, that they'll give you an impossible task that you didn't even know was coming your way to try to get you out of the way. Don't you underestimate how low some folks will go just to try to get you taken down. Even church folk. Yeah, don't underestimate it. David has this target on his back. Saul's going to extra lengths to try to take David out and have no blood on his hands. In spite of the fact that David fought for King Saul and for Israel and was the reason they won the battle over Goliath. In spite of the fact that David was the one who ministered to Saul when he was having these fits and helped to calm him down. In spite of the fact that David was loyal and faithful to him and did nothing to try to usurp his authority but respected and submitted to his authority. In spite of the fact that David only tried to help Saul and never tried to hinder Saul, Saul still put a target on David's back and because of his success still tried to take him out. You know what that teaches us? That sometimes the people that you do the most for will be the people that try to take you down. The people that you sacrifice the most for will be the persons that are most ungrateful and will try to sabotage you and set you up and take you out. Here's the final thing. I'm done. This is the other side of success. David shows us that success telegraphs truths about others, how they really feel. That success torments others around you where people will get sick at the very sight of you and the very mention of your name. That success makes you a target where people will do any and everything that they can to take you down and to take you out. And finally, what David's life teaches us is that on the other side of success, success turns acquaintances into adversaries. Turns acquaintances into adversaries. By the way, David not only got 100 foreskins, he got 200 foreskins. The favor of God was so great upon his life that he was able to slip in to the enemy's camp and he was able to bring back to Saul more than Saul ever expected. And ooh, how that rubbed it in Saul's face. That David was so favored by God and so successful because God was with him that he could even bring back more than was required without a scratch on his body. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that? Yeah, that's what God did for David <laughs> in spite of what Saul was trying to do to David. Uh-huh. Here's the final thing. Success turns acquaintances into adversaries. Here's it. Here it is in your Bible one last time. Verse number 28 through 30. This is what it says. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter McCall loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him and he re remained his enemy for the rest of his days. Saul saw that the Lord was with David. And just because the Lord was with David, Saul became his enemy for the rest of his day. I know this sounds far-fetched tonight, but just because the Lord is with you, some people who were acquaintances will turn into lifelong adversaries. There is no other reason given in the scripture why Saul became David's enemy for the rest of his days except that he saw 
the Lord was with him. Yeah, your success from God's hand can cause people who were acquaintances, who were cool with you, who were down with you, who were riding with you, who were rolling with you, people for whom you've done so much, people whom you've served and helped to turn against you and on you for the rest of their days. And verse 30 says this, the Philistine commanders continued to go up and out to battle, and as often as they did, David met with more success than the rest of Saul's officers, and his name became well known. In other words, every time Saul tried to do something to stop David, God did more for David. I'll try it one more time. I'm about to close. <laughs> every time Saul tried to do more to David, God did more for David. I'll try it one more time. Every time Saul tried to do something to David, God did more for David. <laughs> Saul could not handle God's favor upon David's life, and yet every time he turned around, God gave David even more success and even more failure. And so here's, here's the way I want to close this message tonight. You're listening to this message. You're saying, wow, this, this, this is not necessarily the most encouraging message that if I'm going to be a success, then I've got to deal with all of this stuff. I've got to deal with the fact that success telegraphs truths about others and success torments others around me and success puts a target on my back and success turns acquaintances into adversaries. Why do I have to go through all of this? It's God's fault. It's God's will to make you prosperous. It's God's will to make you a success. It's God's will to bless your life. It's God's will to elevate you. It's God's will to use you. It's God's will to enrich you. And because it's God's will, guess what? It's God's bill. In other words, you don't have to live your life of favor and blessing and success in paranoia because you're worried about the souls in your life. You don't have to run around like a sad sack feeling bad about the success that God has given to you in your life. And nor do you have to go around trying to fight every battle. Every time somebody posts something about you that's unfavorable and every time somebody lies on you and every time somebody tries to do something something to you. You don't have to worry about what's going on because if it were not God's will, then you wouldn't be blessed the way you are. But whenever it's God's will, it's also God's bill. In other words, God has to fight for you when you can't fight for yourself. And I heard Pastor Foster remind us tonight that the Lord will fight your battles. The Lord will he will defend you so when the enemy comes in like a flood the Lord will lift up a standard against him and when the enemy comes in one way the enemy will flee seven ways because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world and I'm going to my seat tonight but I thank God for his favor and I thank God for success and I thank God for blessing and I even thank God for what comes with it everything's not going to be easy easy uh, everything's not going to be smooth uh, and everybody's not going to celebrate you uh, but you got a God uh, that is able and willing uh, to not only lift you uh, but also defend you uh, and so thank God uh, when folks start acting foolish uh, and when folks start acting funny because that's confirmation uh, that the Lord is with you uh, and that's my salutation tonight uh, that the Lord is with you yea though I walk through the valley 
of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The Bible says, when mother and father forsake me, then the Lord will bear me up. And I wonder, is there anybody that's excited tonight that no matter what happens, no matter what goes on, God will never leave you. Oh, he will. 